deliverance of forgotten ministry. I don't even hear people talk about it much on TV anymore. I don't even watch Christian TV typically anymore. Whatever you want to say about that's fine with me. I just know I'm right. And uh, it's a forgotten ministry. We don't hear it taught. When we do, people aren't, author they don't understand things the way they teach it. I don't agree with a lot of things because it's, I stay with the word. God told me, I stay with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Do what I did. That's what he told me, Jesus. Then read the book of Acts and do what the early church did. And you won't have all the goof ups like you know that are goof, people are goofed up trying to teach this. So I just stayed with all that. Thank you, Dr. Jacobs. You're welcome. My books are not as exciting as some, but they're accurate. And I've cast the devil out of people all over the world. I was in Siberia one time. I cast the devil out of 37 drug addicts in the same service. Number two, the chapters are the, on the deliverance. If you're interested in the authority of the believer, I, I don't know if I said that this morning. I put that in my angel book. I put it in this because if you don't know you have authority over it, don't read it. You're already messed up. If you don't know you have authority, you won't do anything. And then the problem is some people, we teach them the authority and they won't receive it. Well, you don't know me. No, I don't know you. I know Jesus. Jesus is the one that gave you his authority, not me. He did. It. I'm on his authority. All right. I determined the devil was not going to scare me anymore. Once I quit being a drug addict and got saved, and I said to God, I'm going to serve you like I served him even more radically. And then I got a chapter here, the origin of the devil and demons. I hate to tell you, but he came from heaven. He's a different creature now because of his messed up being. I'm talking about the devil. And then types of demons. This is not a complete list. It's a pretty good list. Lying spirits, spirits of infirmity, spirits of divination, seducing spirits, spirit of heaviness and depression, spirit of suicide, lunatic spirits, antichrist spirits. Antichrist, just whatever people are against the anointing, that's an antichrist spirit working in them. A lot of denominations, they won't go with this because they think, well, I don't see that in the Bible. That doesn't, that doesn't mean you know your Bible yet just because you haven't seen it. Right. Give me a break. Spirit of whoredom, spirit of the world, spirit of error, spirit of fear, a perverse spirit. That's predominant in our culture today. And a lot younger people are involved in things because of telephone, which you can get on in telephone and other things. Familiar spirit, spirit of jealousy. Blind and dumb spirits, dumb spirits and deaf and dumb. And that's not a complete list, but it was a good list. And I put all those in there so people could see what happened to me recently. I will tell this little story. and You won't take this away from my teaching time, will you? This is Sunday night. Where you got to go? Where you got to go? Nowhere. But I was in Dillard shopping. You have a Dillard's here? Do you even know what that is? It's oh, okay. Yeah, it's at the mall somewhere. Yeah, okay. Macon. Oh, that's what you said, Macon. Okay, it's in Macon, Georgia. But anyway, I was I shop at Dillard's and I know the guy over the men's department and stuff. And I was in there and he had a new, a new assistant. His name was Eric. The guy I knew was probably 30, 35. Eric was about 21, 22. And uh, Brother Chris was asking me some questions because I'd known him for a while. And he started asking me questions about spirits. I said, well, what kind of spirits? Are you talking about angelic or demonic? I'm talking about both. I said, well, I got books on both of them. Would you read them? I'll bring them to you and give them to you if you read them. But I'm not going to bring them if you're just going to let them sit around. Because that's no fun. No, I'll read them. So he was asking me some question about one of those books. And I responded. Eric was standing by. He was 21, 22 years old. And so he introduced him to me. I said, hi, how you doing? So I went in there two weeks later. And Chris wasn't there, the main guy. Eric was there. And he came over. Dr. Jacobs, come here. I want to tell you something. I said, what's up? And he said, well, you know, you were talking to Chris. And Chris puts your books back in a back room at the, behind the men's section where we go back there and have a sandwich or drink a cup of coffee. And I got in his book, your book on deliverance the other day. And you know, I had a problem with, uh, uh, let me think, had a problem with uh, fear. And you had a whole chapter in your book on it. I read it and prayed for myself and got delivered. <laughs> and that's exactly why I wrote it. Yes. So people could, could use it. 21-year-old guy working at a Dillard's men's store, at that portion of the store. And I was just so thrilled. I said, that's why I read, I'm so thrilled that you did that. How demons operate, characteristics of demons, objective of demons. And we might not have covered everything in here, but we've covered enough. If you're anywhere in this book, you need help. Let me say, say that. Demons and disease, 
how demons gain entrance. That's a long chapter. It's a good chapter. I think I've listed 10 or 15 things. The occult. And then can a believer have a demon? The simple answer is yes. I don't know why you'd want one because they're only going to mess your life up. Did you ever have them? I sure did. I was a drug addict. I told you that this morning. And, you know, I was hooked on everything but phonics. <laughs> I'm not even going to tell you some of the things I was hooked on. <laughs> and then I have a whole chapter on how to stay free. And I thought, praise God, I finished, finally finished this book. And the Lord said, you're not done. I said, I'm not done. <laughs> okay, what are you wanting? I want you to handwrite a, a chapter on the power of my blood and put it in the book at the end. So I did that. The power of the blood, the blood of sprinkling and faith in the blood. So I think it's a really good book. Personally, I've read it. I've lived it. <laughs> but see, you need to know that so that you don't drag all your misfit friends up to the pastors all the time. Yeah. You could just take them in the bathroom at work and cast the devil out of them. Yeah. Are you kidding me? No, I'm not kidding you a bit. I don't kid about stuff like this. I'm not, I'm not a jokey guy. You're never going to hear me tell a joke to get your attention. That's never going to happen with me. Right. I'm just not that kind of a person. I think that's great if you want to do that if you're a preacher, but I'm not laughing. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. And then I wrote this little book, The Power of the Blood. Yeah. It's a good little book. You can put it in your pocket, wherever, and read it. It's just a short book. And back at the end of this book, I had a prophecy, and they included it in here. This is what I began to say. Find those scriptures that tell you what the blood does and begin to say that and begin to declare that and hold that blood against mental things, hold that blood against emotional instabilities. This is where our, our, our society is at now. We got a mental problem in the world, not just America. I mean, it's just all over the world. People are sick mentally, very sick, in my opinion. That's a, I'm talking to you as a man of God and a prophet and one that's traveled a lot in my life, so just talking. Hold that blood against emotional instabilities and you'll come up and you'll come out and you'll be put over because the blood will not fail you, saith the Lord. The blood shall prevail against all your enemies. The blood shall prevail against every sickness and every disease. The blood shall prevail and overwhelm and overcome every weakness and everything that would come against you. So plead the blood, declare the blood and declare what the covenant says the blood does and it'll be so for you. If you don't declare it, it won't be so. You can see it in the Bible, not say it, it's not working. Everything in the Bible, listen to me, you need to say it. If you're going to believe it, you need to say it. And even if you don't believe it at first, and most of us have never believed it at first, we struggled with that. But if you say it enough, you will convince yourself that's God speaking and it'll start working. There's a putting in, because I studied this in detail, you know, words. There's a putting in and then there's a bringing forth. But when you begin to bring it forth, once you put it in there and meditated on it, and thought about it and repeated it and repeated it and repeated it and asked God for a full revelation, then you start speaking and something creative comes out of your mouth that makes that work for you. That's why people that always quit, they never get anywhere. I'm just not a quitter. I've not been perfect. I just wouldn't quit. I think you think I'm teasing you when you said I was hooked on everything but phonics. I'm not even going to tell you what I was hooked on. All kinds of drugs and weirdness and strangeness. Anyway, that was the old me. Make much about the blood, the blood will make much about you. So if you don't ever talk about the blood, guess what? It's not talking about you. Yeah. It's in the Bible that it's saying things, but you're not saying that because you're complaining about all your issues or whatever. Yeah. I'm not being mean to you. Just listen to me. You're bound to get something out of something I say. Yeah. Yeah. And hold the blood against the, uh, it to secure you and the blood will help you in everyday life and in things that come to challenge your faith. So hold on to the blood. Hold on to it by your confession of faith in it. And it goes on for another two paragraphs, but that's good enough. It's a good little book to carry. And we, the first part of the book is just scriptures concerning the blood of Jesus. Specifically, so you know we're not making something up. Yeah. And this book here, I think it's in, it's maybe in this book and in my angel book, The Authority of the Believer. It's a little pocket book I gave you to put it in your pocket or your purse or wherever. And read it and read it and read it and read it because you need it and I need it. You need to know where your authority's at. Amen. And I'm going to just tell you this Jesus doesn't have any more authority than any of us. He already gave us all his authority. Yes. Matthew 28 All authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. That's where we're living in earth. Go therefore and teach them all that I taught you and 
So he's already given us that. But sometimes people are so into themselves and into their weaknesses that you're making too much about the weakness and not enough about his ability to overcome all that. I mean, listen, I say it this way. If you figure out you're a joint heir with Jesus, your days of trouble are over. I mean, you know, I'm not a sub heir and you're not a sub heir. I don't care what your grandpa told you. He's wrong. We are a joint heir with Jesus or we're nothing. And because he put us there, I didn't put myself there. I even had a little vision recently about it, which is really cool. And I'm going to tell you about it, even if it's hard to comprehend. I saw Jesus head in a chair, like one of these chairs, and he looked at me. And he wasn't, it wasn't bizarre. I don't watch shows like, what is that called? That saying, I show I said this, so, good morning America, that lady. What is that called? The Walking Dead? What kind of human being watches that and broadcasts it? God forgive you if you watch stupid stuff like that. God's not going to be able to help you. Just have all you want, but you're not going to go nowhere with it. I can tell you that. There's a girl on there, a lady on there is very well-dressed, well-spoken, on and on I could go. And she stood there in front of the whole American audience. I don't even watch Good Morning America anymore because of her. Because she said, that's my favorite show, The Walking Dead. And I looked at my wife and said, that lady is sick, 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 sick. I don't watch stuff like that. And you shouldn't either. I got one amen and nobody else saying nothing. Okay. I mean, even if I'm watching TV, I'm not anti-TV. But if I'm watching TV and something comes on that makes me feel uncomfortable, not that I don't have authority over it, but for that reason, I'm not going to let that get in my eye gate or my ear gate because that's not good for my mental health or my emotional stability and all that stuff. Amen. And I worked hard to get out all of my weirdnesses. Yes. I know you probably think I'm perfect, but I'm not. But I had to work at those areas that were weak. I put them under my feet. You know what I did? I wrote a note to the devil and taped it to the bottom of my shoes. <laughs> and I wrote, you're defeated and I'm not. Ha ha. Because he's under my feet. So I walked around with that. Re- Lo, he could read it when I walked around during the week here. Kept him on there for about a month. You know, and he saw me coming. Oh, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> we'll talk a little more about angels tonight. Let's go to Hebrews 1 again. I'm kind of teasing with you. If you don't know me yet, I can tease sometimes. And I halfway mean it and maybe not. But don't get offended because I say something that is a little silly kind of or whatever. So we're going to talk tonight, and we're going to get it introduced first, and then we're going to talk tonight about personal angels. Now, you can call them guardians if you want. I can give you the references for that. There's one chapter in the Bible that I know of in Daniel 4. I'm asking you to turn to Hebrews. Did I say that? Yes. Yeah, so stay in Hebrews, but I'll go talk, keep talking. I think Daniel 4, verse 13, 17, and 23 all have the recording of Nebuchadnezzar. Of course, he's, a, he's, not, an, he's not the right kind of person at that moment. But anyway, he called them watchers. But in the Hebrew, the word is guardians. And he said the holy ones came down. That just meant they appeared to him in the natural realm. They weren't all in heaven necessarily. I'll talk about that in just a minute further for you because you can misinterpret some scriptures that uses the word heaven. Heaven is, when Paul got saved, he said there were three heavens. So I go with him, not Jesus, because Paul came later in the new covenant. I'm not trying to put Jesus down, but he was not a new covenant person. When he walked the earth, he was an old covenant prophet and he was all the fivefold ministry rolled into one. You know, he was the shepherd and all that. But anyway, you just need to realize when you read heaven, make sure you're rightly dividing it. Is he talking about heaven, the planet, or is he talking about the stellar heavens, or is he talking about this unseen realm that exists right along this natural realm? I told you this morning, I'm going to tell you again, your angels are with you tonight unless you fired them. You know, some people just fire them. They never say anything that they can do, so why do they even follow you anymore? I'm not saying they're going to walk away, but I don't know for sure the answer to that. I just know I keep myself engaged in that conversation with them. Even if I don't see them, I speak to them the Word, and they're obligated because I put a voice to this Word, (coughs) which there is no voice to it, unless you put one to it. People say, my Bible spoke to me. What do you mean by that? Well, something triggered in your inner man, that may have happened. But if the Bible really speaks to you audibly, uh, that's what we're talking. You have to put a voice to the scriptures you find, and that engages those scriptures where those angels hear you say that, 
and then they start operating. I'm going to talk in depth about this a little bit tonight, not, maybe not fully, but a little bit. You're responsible, not Jesus, not God. He's already charged his angels. And like I said, if that would just manifest totally, then I wouldn't even need to teach you. Your life would be perfect on this planet, but it isn't perfect. I don't measure on the imperfectness. I measure on what I have in Christ. But this world is not perfect, and there's a lot of goofball people out there doing terrible things. And I'm delivered from them. Because I'm delivered, 2 Timothy 4, from every evil work. That's one of the best scriptures in the Bible I can give you, 2 Timothy 4, 17 and 18. You ought to go study it and then speak it. Well, I couldn't tell anything was happening. Well, that doesn't mean it's not working just because you couldn't tell anything was happening. How spiritual are you? I don't know. I'd have to, I don't, I'm not trying to figure you out. I'm just trying to work with me. I just keep saying the things I know to say if it's in the Bible. I don't care if I've had to say it a million times. I just keep with it. I stay with, I stay with it. Even some of my enemies tell me that. You know, people that left my church that were mad. I'll tell you one thing, you just stay with the kind of guy. And I said, yeah, I am. I wish you'd have been, but you're not. So goodbye, bye. I can tell you're frustrated and you're offended. So go on down the trail if you need to. I know I'm right. I'm teaching you the Bible. I'm sorry you don't get it. All right. Praise God. Thank you, doctor. You're welcome. All right. Most of them don't even take the time to tell me they're leaving. They just disappear. Anyway, and I'm not concerned about that. I'm concerned about getting the right thing to the people. And then they have to make decisions just like every human has to make. Yeah, your husband and wife may not like it. That don't matter either. If you're in the scriptures and you're doing what God told you to do in the scriptures, you're right. Yes. Period. Don't matter if anybody likes it. If you're doing it scripturally, then you're right. That's a good thing to know. So I'm not deterred because somebody's mad at me because they didn't like what I said. Especially my spiritual father book. Man, I got so criticized over that. Some of my best friends left me over that book. I said, well, I'm not apologizing for it. I put in there the chapters and verses, everything that I said, I had chapter and verse for it. You're not mad at me. You're mad at God. Don't come in here and tell me you're mad at me. You don't want to stay, then leave. There's the door. There's the exit. But I'm not going to take the offense because I treated you right. And I helped you when you were in trouble several times. And I reminded them of that while they were telling me they didn't like me anymore. No. And I'm not going to beg you to stay after you've already made a deal out of me. Like you don't like me no more because I printed something you didn't like. It's in the Bible or I wouldn't have wrote it. Just remember, I always have scriptures in my back pocket. One in this hole in my mouth right here. One in my ear and two in my toe. You know, I just got a lot of scriptures. Or I wouldn't say things. All right, I got to get started here. Say amen if you can. <laughs> Hebrews 1, 13, 14. But to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. He didn't say that to an angel. He's given a comparison between the angels and Jesus. And then he follows up with verse 14. Are they, referring back to the comment, the angels, are they the angels? Are they not all ministering spirit? So I like to say they all have a job description. You know, there's a fivefold ministry in the body of Christ. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. And then there's a ministry of helps. Dad used to say, that's the hand that holds up the fingers. And just like this church, I know you had people out in the parking lot helping me. You had people under the, you know, had an umbrella for me. This gentleman back here, he unlocked the door for me uh, this morning, the guy in the back back here. And different things. You got singers, you got teachers, you got, you know, classes. All that's important. All right. So it says here, these angels, they're all ministering. I'd like to say they all have a job description. Some of them do multiple things. Some of them just do one thing. I told you about the, the, the angel that does lungs. And I was with Pastor Hernandez. You guys know him maybe, don't you? In uh, uh, Olathe, Kansas. I'm going there in a couple more weeks. A guy in his church caught me in California and he said, you remember me? And I said, you know, sir, I'm sorry. I'm not belittling you by saying I don't know. I said, I travel all the time. All the time. I'm probably in 30, 40 churches a year now. And uh, I wasn't pushing for it. It just happened. But uh, who are you and why are you talking to me? He said, I'm with Pastor Hernandez. I said, okay, I know him. He's the son to me. And he said, yeah, I know. And my son had asthma really bad when he was born. And it went from birth to about 10. 
every month we'd have to rush him to the emergency room at least, you know, twice a month because he couldn't breathe. That's a scary thing when you can't breathe. It's always dad and mom are running him into the ER and they're giving him a shot or they're treating him for something. I don't know how they do all that, but he said, but I gave him to you one time. You prayed over him about asthma. He never had another episode. So after three years where we were going every month a couple times to the hospital, he didn't have any events for three years. I took him back to the lung doctor and he said, well, your boy looks like he's got brand new lungs. How'd that happen? No, oh, he said, I wanted to thank you for that. Well, you're welcome. I'm glad God did that. I'm just a delivery guy. I'm just a FedEx. You know, I'm not him. He lives in me. He gave me a healing endowment. We can get a lot of people healed of certain areas we have greater strength in, like parts, body parts, sometimes cancer, all the itises, arthritis, bursitis, all that stuff, things like that. Anyway, so he said he's been free for 10 years. I said, my goodness. I didn't know that. Thank you for telling me that. You know, I think only one in 10 ever write me and tell me. And I, I, there's, a little, there's a little piece of paper back there about this big. It's got lines on it that if you get healed or delivered, and I'm not telling you to grab one, but if you get in my ministry line and you can take one, and when you do get healed and you go back to the doctor and he confirms it, if you need that, go back. I'm not afraid of that. I'm not responsible to get you anything. I'm responsible to make something available to you. If you get it or don't get it, that's between you and the Lord. You may have something I don't, I'm, not, I'm not aware of. Yeah. You know, if I operate in word of knowledge, that doesn't mean I know everything about your life, how many kids you have, where you live, how you act at home. Yeah. You know. Yeah. All right. It's just a word. It's not everything about your life. Sometimes I'm in meetings and people say, well, you stand in front of me, you look me in the face. I thought you knew everything about me. I said, no, I don't. You have something you need to tell me? <laughs> All right. But these angels have different ministries and they've been sent forth. Not only they've been sent forth by God already in the Old Testament, you know, and like let's say this, not only that, they were in the earth before he even created man. You read book of Job, you'd see that. The angels were singing when he was creating man. And I personally, this is how I think. I think Psalm 8 is attributed to David, but I think really it was an angel that wrote that. They said, what kind of being has he made? He made this thing called Adam. Gave him dominion. Evidently, the angels didn't have that level of dominion. Anyway, just thought. Anyway, so praise God. So these angels here, they're all ministering spirits. They have a ministry. That doesn't mean you've tapped into it, but they're always available. They've been sent forth. They're first sent forth by God in the earth, but then we help send them forth by our words and our vocabulary on a daily basis. The name of my book is Angels on Earth. They're waiting on you. I did it that way on purpose. What does that mean? That means angels are standing around waiting and they're talking to each other. You think he's ever going to say anything we could do? I don't know. It's been five years. He ain't said nothing yet. <laughs> you know, the way you talk, you've got beings listening to you, good and bad. <laughs> and if you say you're not smart, you're not going to be smart because they will help keep you from being smart. You say, I can't do that. Then you can't do that. The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm not saying I can do it by myself, but I'm not trying to do it by myself. I've been working hard on getting me out of the way for 50 some years. 52 years I've been saved. Just talking to you. So it says, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Praise God. And so if they, this is the thing I like to say, let me move this verse 14 for you a little bit in your thinking. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who are the heirs of salvation? If he would send angels to help me when I was not an heir, how much more would he do for me now? Because I'm a son of God. And you women are daughters of God or sons of God too. Don't let those things hang up. If you're a child of God, that's what you are. You're a son or a daughter. The women have the wombs. That's the only difference I can see scripturally. You have the same authority any man has. Okay, I'm just not getting conflicted here. I'm trying to help you. Those who are the heirs of salvation. Let me go a little further here a minute, and then I'll come back and pick up something. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. And what are we talking about? We're talking about angels and Jesus right here. Chapter 1, chapter 2. At least a good portion of chapter 2 is still talking about angels and Jesus, comparing them. 
So he says, you need to give more understanding to the things which you've heard about angels and us, humans, at least at any time. So at any time you want, you could forget it. And many have. At least at any time, we should let them slip. Now, I did this on a level that I don't know if you can understand me or not. If you can't, just, just let me talk. I went to a church to preach. I love the pastor. I know him quite well. He's a good friend of mine. And I taught on angels. First time there. Because anymore, wherever I go, I know most churches, even if they have good pastors, maybe they've never expounded on angels to any length. They may have mentioned them. And it may even mention one thing that they could do. That's fine with me. But I'd like to get you a little more grounded where you realize they're with you every day, every night, until you're done in this planet. Yes. And the primary thing all of them are called to do is protect you. Yes. From what? From everything that's tr trying to destroy you. <laughs> Anything that's trying to destroy you. Amen. So I went to that church, taught on the first time. Uh, and I left. I came back to the next two or three or four years. And the fifth time I went back, he'd asked me to come back. I didn't call. And I, the Lord said, go back and act like you're teaching something new. Don't tell them that. You'd be lying because you already taught them once. Just go back and say, we're going to talk on angels and teach, use the same examples, the same scriptures, the same illustrations. And nobody said diddly squat to me after I taught it the first time. Do you know what I mean, diddly squat? They didn't say, hey, that's great. I love it. This is wonderful. They just were mum. Nobody's saying nothing, even after I'm done with the whole conference. So I went back to that fifth year, and I taught the same things I taught the first year. I didn't tell them I was doing that. I didn't tell the pastor. I am still never told them. And they said, man, that's the greatest thing I've ever heard. I said, really? They said, yeah. I said, well, wow, I'm glad you're getting it. And I'd said the same thing identical to them five years earlier. They didn't get it. Just went right over them, right beside them. I don't know where it went, in the trash can, I guess, but... They didn't make, do any adjustments. So it's not like I feel like everybody doesn't know anything. I just don't think most believers know enough to really be intelligent when it comes to releasing their angels and sending them forth to help them to do certain things. And in my book, I don't have a complete list of everything they do. I'd have to write another 500-page book. But I wrote the most essential things that they can do to help you. And all you got to do is follow my pattern and speak to them those scriptures that indicate that. And you know, they'll help you prosper. Yes. Yes. Guess what book it first shows up in? Genesis, of course. Yeah. And somebody say, you believe that? Yeah, I believe it. And Abraham's servant he said, what if she won't come with me? Well, you just go tell her what I said. And when she doesn't come, you're, uh, you're out of the oath. He made him put his hand under his thigh. That was a sign of oath taking then because he's a servant to Abraham to get his son a good wife. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I thought about this a lot. What kind of girl goes with a total stranger and leaves her family? I mean, it'd have to be God on that man talking to her. To, to get on a camel and ride however long it took to get back to Abraham, I don't know about the length of that, but I just think in the whole thing's, wow. Yeah. And so his, he said, my master's been brought into prosperity through the angels in part. And he said, one of my angels will go with you and prosper your journey. Mm -hmm. See, so they help with prosperity in our life. You know, I'm a tither, so I say, Father, I thank you for the angels out there the bringing the finances that I need for my ministry. And when I was pastoring for my church, but now I'm not pastoring. I'm a member there. My son's a pastor. Uh, my name's on everything. If people get mad and they leave, I still got to pay for whatever's left to be paid on. But I'm just talking. I'm not mad about it. I'm thrilled about it. But I say for whatever I'm called to do. You see what I'm saying? And I release them. Boy, my thing is sewing. I'm on this side of the ledger. I'm a sewing person. And so God takes care of me. Yes. I don't just tithe. That's way back. Yes. That's almost 50 years ago when I started tithing, my wife and I. We never missed a lick either. We were both committed to it. I'm not bragging on us. We just did what we did. Yes. We had babies during that time. We had hard times during that time. Sometimes one time she was pregnant, we only had some peanut butter and popcorn to eat. But God got us through. Yes. Hallelujah. Okay, you got to let me get back to the Bible here. What are you talking to me here? <laughs> Don't let these things slip. I brought up that whole church to show you. As a whole church, I took one, two, three services, I think, maybe four, but three at least. Talked about angels from the beginning like I did with you and talked to them about other things about angels. And I brought my material, my book and things like that. 
and sold those that they could have read. And at that time, I carried my teaching with me. Now, I don't carry uh, like my CDs with me, but you can get, there's a little thing back there on my table that's got a picture of me and it tells you how to get on our, okay, help me. I'm, I'm challenged. Podcast, thank you. And there's over 200 messages on there for free. You can download everything I preach that I kept. Now, I didn't keep everything I preached. That'd be 10,000 messages in 50 years or 46 years of full-time ministry. But I have essentially a lot of things on there. And all you got to do is tune in to me on your phone, on your computer, or whatever kind of gizmos you got. I don't know. People got all kinds of gizmos. You know what I mean? Yeah. Electronic stuff. Anyway. All right. Hang on a minute here. Look at verse 2. For if the word spoken by angels, chapter 2, verse 2. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast in every transgression and disobedience received just recompense to reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness with signs and wonders and different miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. So we see in this, and he's still talking about angels, verse 5, for under the angels, he's still talking about angels, seven more verses. So he's talking here about angels, and he said, God bears witness with them in different signs and wonders and different kinds of miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost. So, you know, and I wanted to mention verse 3 to you again. I have said, mentioned it already. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? That is the word salvation, but it means this. It means preservation and healing, soundness and deliverance. That's the meaning of that word right there. So it's not just the new birth. In particular, what's he talking about here? Us and angels. So how are we going to escape some things that are coming if we don't employ these angels to help us? Yeah. And the answer is you're not. I mean, if I could cut a hole in heaven and ask God to send down 15 people that died prematurely, I'd line them up. What's your name? My name's Kathy. What happened to you? I drowned when I was 12 in my pool in the backyard. Did you go to church? Yeah, all the time. Did your parents go to church? Yeah, all the time. Did your preacher ever teach you about angels? Nope. Did you ever read a book about angels? Nope. Did you ever hear about angels? Nope. Yeah, yeah. Okay, next. My name's Henry. How old are you, Henry? I'm 27. Yeah. I was in a bad accident, head-on collision, it killed me. Did you ever go to church? All the time, my parents and I both went. And did you ever hear about angels? Nope. Did you ever read a book about them? Nope. Did you ever hear any preacher talk about them? Nope. Okay, next. Yeah. And he's up there, she was up there at whatever age. Yeah. <laughs> You're supposed to live out your life before you go. Yeah. I'm just, I'm not making fun. It's tragic if you have to bury your own children. Yeah. I'm not making fun of that at all. I'm just showing you a thing that I know for a fact happened. Because that tells us, that warns us there. How are we going to escape? In other words, you're not. I'm not talking about money now. I'm not talking about where you work now. I'm not even talking about your marriage making it. I'm not talking about any. I'm talking about you living your life out in this planet. Yes. <laughs> and that becomes pretty important, I think. The more you live, the more you know. The more you know, the more you can do. If you'll do it. <laughs> okay. So I'm just talking here. And then down here in verse 4, just to give you a little insight. Bearing signs and wonders. We know back in the Old Testament, we have uh, uh, Daniel in the lion's den. You know, he, he got thrown down into a hole and there's lions down there and they haven't been fed. I, just to help you know, they didn't shoot them full of some narcotics before they put them in there. The lions. And so an angel grabbed one. This is my interpretation. I think I'm smarter than most of them on this. Grabbed that lion by the throat and held him up and said, either simmer down or you're going to face me. Simmer down. So Daniel said, it's cold in this dirt. Get up here. I need a pillow. I'd like a foot rest. And I'd like the rest of you roll into me and keep me warm. And that's what they did. Because they know they were, that, lot, that angel was going to take them on and do whatever to them. You know, if it had been Samson, they'd been hair, teeth, and eyeballs everywhere. <laughs> He's a bad motor scooter. All right. But the angels came and delivered him. And of course, Nebuchadnezzar, he's on Valium. He's a really wreck. He liked Daniel, but he, 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 his, his own order was to throw people in there if they didn't. When the music played, you're supposed to bow down and worship this God. And Daniel wasn't going to do that. And so he comes to the hole in the morning. Hey, Daniel, are you still down there? Yeah, I sure am. I'm, and he said, I wasn't guilty before God or you. And then that guy took all the people that trumped up the charges on Daniel Husbands, wives, and children threw them all in before they ever hit the bottom of the, of the hole. They were all dead. So there wasn't a misfunctioning lion. Right. 
They were just controlled by intimidation from the angel. So they did what Daniel told them to do or what the angel told them to do or a combination of that. We did a lot of protection here we're talking about. All right. So we have that. Then in John 5, we have the gate. They came into the gate. I forget what it's called there. And they were all cripples and different things. And, could, and the first one into the water, when the water was stirred, got healed, the Bible says, of whatever disease they had. If they had leprosy, they got healed. If they had some other kind of terrible disease, they got healed. Whatever it was, that angel brought some kind of, uh, I don't know what I'd call it, I'd call it some kind of anointing. And when people acted on it to get in the water where they saw it stirring because it was not stirred all the time, they jumped in. Whoever got in first got healed. Amen. So that's a sign and a wonder. How many know that's a sign and a wonder? How many know people are not going to hang around a, pe a group of water unless they have, have some belief they might get delivered? Right. They wouldn't be camped out there every day. Yeah. Anyway, we're just talking about things here. So we have different signs and wonders and various miracles that took place through the angels. And that's what they help us with, a lot of things like that. All right. Now, I'm starting down in the real, what I'm going to teach you tonight. Let me see what time it is. I don't want to look at that. I'll look at mine. It's the same thing. <laughs> okay. Let's go back to Job chapter 4. Can anything good come out of Job? How about Job? I don't know why people are so burnt. Excuse the expression. I'm just so old. Drug, a drug person. I call people burnt. They're just burnt. You know, they don't understand anything. Uh, you know, Job was a real man. He, the Bible indicates what he did and how he messed up. He got in fear. And that's a good thing I will warn you of. If you have children, don't get in fear over them. My goodness, pray and believe God. So anyway, he messed up. But that doesn't mean everything in the whole book of Job is wrong. At the end of it, you know, he was told to go... Uh, he, God talked to him and said, you know, I repent because I was saying things I didn't know anything about. That's what a lot of people do. And they get in trouble because they're speaking contrary to the word. But this tells us a little bit about Job in the fourth chapter and the angels that God assigned to him. I'm talking about you and personal angels. That's what we're talking about tonight. It's going to get deeper as we go. But let's look at Job 4.18 first. Behold, he put no trust, or we would say faith, in his servants, and his angels, plural, he charged with folly, or we would just say foolishness. You know, when you talk to your angel foolishly, like you're speaking contrary to the Bible, that's what that sounds like to them. They only adhere to the Bible. They don't adhere to me because I'm Michael Jacob. They adhere to me because I speak the word out of my mouth and they do what I say. I was just thinking about this recently. It's kind of interesting. I've been studying this subject since 1980. Uh, I think I told about my vision when I was five this morning. Did I talk to you about it? My mother, yeah. That was my first experience of ever seeing something godly over in another realm. When I became a drug addict, I saw a lot of things, but it was all demonic then. And I didn't care anyway, so it didn't matter to me at that point. But now that I'm saved and I've had a lot of vision since then, but I'm saying to you is you can't speak contrary to the Bible and the angels help you. Now, the Amplified Bible, which, you know, I had to take Greek in, in, the sem, in Bible school. It's a trontary language. I mean, it's a very complicated language. It has eight different uh, tenses where the English only has past, present, and future. But the Greek New Testament has all these. But this is Hebrew from the Old Testament. Yet the Bible here in the Amplified Bible is very accurate. It says he puts no trust or faith or confidence in his heavenly servants. So he's not talking about a person. He's talking about angelic beings. In verse 18, he put, didn't put any faith in them. And, he, and in his angels, which I told you a little bit about, Brother Kenneth E. Hagin and um, Richard Sigmund, his book, My Time in Heaven, and how they both conferred. And God said to them, you had more than one angel watching over you. You have one main angel that's assigned to you, but he has other angels under him. Well, you could not believe it, so whatever, but I believe it. Yeah. I always thought that, but I didn't have anything to prove it. Now, in the sense that I'm saying this to you, uh, and this is one verse that I have that validates that he had angels, plural, assigned to him. Yeah. And besides that, he's even Old Testament. He's not even in our covenant, which is better than that. Yeah. Just thought I'd bring that to your attention. Yeah. So you don't think I'm just grasping for something to try to make it sound interesting. 
I'm not, I don't make it sound interesting, I make it sound real, if you're listening to me. And I walk in it myself. <laughs> so his angels, he had plural, he charged with folly. Well, if you charge them with foolishness, they're not going to do what the Bible says because you're not talking the Bible. The angels of God, the elect angels, the good angels, the holy angels are called in some, oh, they're called elect angels, same beings. They are sent by God to help us in the earth walk. And that's why they've been sent to help us because this is a corrupt planet now because of what Adam did with Satan. He, he yielded to something. God said, you can do anything you want, but don't do that. And that's what he did. He did the one thing he wasn't supposed to do, him and his wife both. All right. So we're seeing here, first of all, he should have had some faith or confidence in his, and I'm putting it in this term because the Amphite says, his heavenly servants are his spiritual servants that came from heaven originally, but they're in the earth with Job now, but they're not any value to him. Now, I just think that, to me, that's so pathetic to think of a human being that's in the church that loves Jesus and you, you love your wife, you love your kids and all that, and you have no revelation of any kind of thing but just you making your way in the earth. That's kind of pathetic, I think, because, you know, I'm just not that smart. I don't talk like that and say I'm not, but, but without God, I'm not. And I know the angels take care of me. And when my kids got bigger, of course, I was a dad and I raised my kids. I didn't just have kids. I raised them. And I taught them right from wrong. And I said, if you don't do what I say, you're going to get punished for that. I had to tell my daughter, drop this guy one time because he's not right for you. You don't need to tell me what you have done or haven't done. I just tell you, I don't like the boy. Don't bring him around. And if you try to date him, I'm going to find out and I'm going to confront you again. Then you're in some bigger trouble with me. Yeah. Yeah. Get rid of this guy. Mm-hmm. Was he a joke? Yeah, he was a joke to me because I knew. I knew more than I wanted to say to her. Yeah. But I said, you get rid of him. Yes. Amen. And then my little foo-foo girl that came to see my son. <laughs> Remember, it was this Hallmark moment. She was so pretty. She came to the door, rang the doorbell, opened the door. Yeah, what do you want? Well, can I come in? No. Who called you? Somebody called you from my house and tell you to come? Yeah. No. Well, I'm sure I didn't. Is that your car? Yeah. Go get in it and leave it. Leave. <laughs> Goodbye. Yeah. Did you feel bad about it? Not a bit. I'm a dad. I'm a father. I don't know about dads these days. They seem like a little chicken, whatever. I better not say that word. Anyway. <laughs> Anyway, Job here, he's having a bad time because he's charging his angels with folly and they're not doing anything for him because of that. They want to, they'd like to, they got the ability to do things that he can't do, but they're not activated when you talk foolishness to them. That's, that's just what's, but the devil will accommodate. And so let's go, let's, are you with me so far? Let's go over to Revelation, the last chapter in the Bible and look at a couple of verses here because I'm still talking about these angels that have been given to help us in our earth walk. So Revelation 22, and John is talking about John the Apostle in the first chapter of Revelation. God, Jesus said he sent his angel, and the only reason he had an angel called his angel is he was born here. He came through the womb of a woman. That's the only way to get here. Anybody here didn't come through the womb of a woman? Let me pray for you. (laughs) No, you all came the same way, didn't you? Anybody here birthed on Mars and you got sin here or something? No. All right. And he, and he said, I've come to give you some things to come. And my angel's going to reveal that to you. So John's been taken up with this angel for however long the book of Revelation took to write. And he gets to the last chapter, verse 8 and 9. I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard and seen, I fell down. And by the way, there's 68 references to angels in the book of Revelation. 68 of the 300. That's a massive amount of scriptures. <laughs> so I can say this without any kind of question unless you just don't think. The end time thing is going to be full of angelic ministry to the limit we've never seen it before. I saw a bunch of them coming to the earth in the 90s, and then I've seen a bunch recently coming to the earth, other angels that weren't here heretofore. And the ones that are here, they stay here. They don't go back to heaven. Okay, let me, let me hang on with you here. And when I heard and seen them, I fell down to worship, verse 8, before the feet of the angel which showed me. So John's getting ready to worship this angel being. And then said he, the angel unto me, unto John, see that you don't do that. For I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. You worship God. I don't worship angels. People have accused me of that just because I can teach it. 
He said, I never said I worshiped angels. Where'd you get that? I've never worshiped an angel and I never will because that would be blasphemy. That'd be idolatry. They don't deserve to be worshiped. They would be respected and I'm to give them the license to help me in this planet by the words I speak based on the scriptures. And you know, you, you, you're not going to get all this by Tuesday. Just listen to me. You're going to have to start studying, get my book and get a good concordance. Look it up like I did. I can help you. And if you get on my, what is that called again? A podcast. I probably got six series on there on angels, different things that I don't have time to teach you. And I'm not complaining about the length of my meeting. That's not it. I'm not insulting the pastor. I'm thrilled to be here with you. Okay. But I can't teach you in three sessions what it took me 35, 40 years to learn. <laughs> That's impossible. So you're going to have to do some study yourself. But my point is the angel said, don't worship me. You worship God. So you, whenever I talk about angels, they came in one of my visions, they knelt down by me, they weren't worshiping me, and I certainly was not worshiping them. And I don't know if I'll talk about that tonight or not. I've got to move ahead here. So Job had angels, but he charged, plural, he had angels, and, but he charged them with foolishness. So they didn't do anything for him. So when they didn't do anything for him, the other group, which is demonic, is listening for you too, you know. Fallen angels and different evil spirits. There's two different things there, but they're still both negative and evil. <laughs> and when you say things that you just are joking about or you think's funny, but if it came to pass, it would cause detriment to your life. I would quit saying that. No, no matter how much you feel like you'd like to talk like that. I've been there when I did talk like that. And I didn't care what you thought about it at the time when I was a drug addict. I carried a gun. I didn't care what anybody thought about it. I was just going to be a drug addict until I died. And then I died. And then I didn't want to die no more. And I wanted to get out of that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just being honest with you. Yeah. I wanted to get away. Yeah. I'm going to see my friend shot to death and all that kind of stuff. And I just, I just can't. Anyway, I won't go into that with you tonight. But this angel tells us just what all of them would say. Don't worship us. You get into that kind of stuff. Then the Bible says even the devil can become an angel of light to your perception. You could perceive something. Like I say to people, I don't have any pixie dust. You're not going to Neverland. I'm a brother. You know Peter and his brother John and Wendy, this girl's name I think, and uh, you know whatever that's called. We don't have that. We don't have pixie dust or magic wands or magic carpets or anything. We have God and his authority and his angels to help us achieve things and move through life without being always buffeted and fighting for our life. <laughs> and if you just get up every day and say, Father, I thank you, and I'm going to give you this in just a minute from your Bible before I quit tonight. They would maybe encourage you. Father, I'm delivered from all injury, harm, and destruction today because my angels have charge over me to keep me safe today. And then I pray for my, well, my wife's not with me anymore, but my children, I got two children. I've got four grandchildren. And I pray for the church where my son pastors, which is my home church where I grew up a lot. I pray for my sons and daughters in the ministry. You know, all the people that are committed to me that pastor or, or are missionaries or kind of a combination, some of them. And, uh, and I pray for Pastor Nancy because I'm on her board and I appreciate her. Anyway, I'm just talking. You don't have to know every scripture. You could just find one or two and just go with it. But we're talking about personal angels here. Let me see where I want to go. Let's go back to Genesis 48. Are you with me so far? I'm going to try to cover more tonight because I, I don't know. I guess Scott telling stories tonight, today. And uh, it's Genesis 48. And this is the story of Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel who, if you remember, in, and I'm just giving you this to think, I want you in chapter 48, but in Genesis 32, he wrestled with an angel all night. And Hosea says, and he won. Jacob won. He's not even born again, but he beat that angel. But think about us. What do you think? You're, you're less than him or more than him? Let me see if you got it. You're more than him. You're not in the old covenant. There's no mysticism about wearing a Jewish prayer shawl to pray. And there's no thing about having a covering on your head. You could be as mean to the devil and have a tablecloth on your head, ladies. That's right. You know, or the men too. So Jacob was a surplanter, a con man. I can't believe him. Him and his mother 
plotted this thing against his father and his brother, who was kind of a guy that wore, had a Confederate flag on his Ford pickup truck and a shotgun in the back window. How, yeah, I mean, you see people like that here? Did they do that here in Georgia? Oh my God. <laughs> he wanted to kill his brother after he robbed him of the birthright and he couldn't reverse it. Anyway, he was just a rascal, but now he's been changed. He went through some changes there from chapter 32 and back further when he was doing that to his brother. And now he's called Israel, which means a prince with God. So that angel did change his name. And verse 14, I'm in, I'm in Genesis 48, 14. And Israel, which is Jacob, same person, stretched out his right hand, laid upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands we, wittingly, we don't talk like that, skillfully, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And his son observed that with his two sons and said, Dad, you're confused. You put the wrong hand on the wrong kid. But see, Manasseh had done some things you can read about. I don't have to look up everything for you. It's in Genesis that was inappropriate. So he got demerit, demer, de, 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 he got demer, demerits. And his other brother got the blessing of the firstborn when he was really the firstborn, but he was messed up. He was involved in things that not nice to talk about, but you can read it in the Bible. And he blessed Joseph, that's his son, and these are two of Joseph's sons, and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long. Notice he had a long life unto this day. And the angel which redeemed me, so he's talking about an angel that was personally assigned to Israel or Jacob. Now watch this. And the angel which redeemed me from all evil. You know, part of evil is sickness and disease in Deuteronomy 7.15. You can go look that up yourself. I'm just giving you the verse if, you're, if you want to do it. You don't have to look it up right now while I'm talking, but Deuteronomy 7.15 says, I'm going to lay none of the evil diseases of Egypt upon you. The world. So we shouldn't be afraid of the world's diseases or any other diseases. None of them come from God. God don't have any disease in heaven. I wouldn't want to go to heaven for a moment if I thought disease was up there. I've already had to deal with it in this planet all my life. Now I'm 70. going to be 74 in a few days. He said, the angel which redeemed me, or we would, a better word, I like the word redeemed, but let's, let me give you another word. Delivered me from all evil. Whatever evil was, he delivered me from all of it. Bless the lads. Now here he said something that I hadn't thought about a lot and I went back and studied it a little further. Bless the lads. He's telling his angel to bless these grandchildren and let my name be named on them in the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Not get drunk at the senior prom and run into a telephone pole and kill you and your girlfriend. Right, right. I knew people that did that. That's why I brought it up. Well, just talking here. So... Now, this is interesting here. He says the angels could bless them. And in this context here, he is commissioning his angel that belonged to him. I, you know, Abraham, wait a minute, uh, Jacob and then Israel, that's the same man, just two different names, to stay in the earth and take care of these grandchildren. I thought that's amazing. So, and I may do that too when I get ready to go home. My grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, maybe by then, we'll see. I mean, it's not too far off. My one grandson's 16. I mean, I don't think he's going to have a baby next year, but nonetheless, I'm just talking. You list? Okay. <laughs> so here we see a man in the first book of the Bible that had a personal angel assigned to him to deliver him from every evil work. What a deal. Of course, he lived right after he, that angel dealt with him and all that. You know, he was just a scoundrel. I used to live with bikers, and they were some tough people. I mean, really murderers and all that. Not proud of it. I'm just telling you the way it was. So, you know. Anyway, just to, so here we see even in the first book of the Bible, and back even further than that, even Adam. I mean, that angel stood and defended the turf that he was in because he didn't want because God didn't want Adam to go back in there and eat of the tree of life and live forever in a lost state. Yeah. He'd already disobeyed him once. He wasn't going to take a chance he'd disobey him again. Yeah. Or we wouldn't be saved. We wouldn't be having church today. <laughs> There'd be no reason for it. Yeah. Yeah. If we're all going to hell, you follow what I'm saying? Right. I, I know it's a raw way to say it, but you understand what I mean. 
So we're seeing personal angels were assigned to people. And this gentleman, he lived a long life. I think I wrote it here somewhere. 147 years old when he went home, Jacob. 147. But praise God, I'm just talking to you. You with me? Yes. All right, let's go over to Matthew 18 now. I'm talking about personal angels to you. Matthew 18, we're going to see what Jesus said about it. You know, if he didn't say anything about it, I would probably bring it up. But he said a lot about angels. And, and everything Jesus did is not always written, but you get a consensus if you read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what kind of man he was. Like, for example, I remember the first time that he uh, went to his hometown and preached, and you would have thought, everybody, let's vote him on his pastor. They weren't thinking that at all. Well, let's take him to the brow of the hair and throw him over the cliff because you're going to kill him if you throw him over that cliff. Brother Hagin said that in a tape I heard. He was there and saw where that hill was. You throw a man off that cliff, he's not going to live. And yet it says all of a sudden they were all, I think it was the same angels that was back in Sodom, just waved his hand. Everybody went blind. Jesus just walked off. They couldn't find him because they couldn't see him. You can think what you want, but I mean, that's pretty solid if you listen to me. Yeah. So anyway, Jesus believed in personal angels. He's going to tell us something right here. Look at this, verse 10, Matthew 18, 10. Are you with me? Yes. I'm still talking about personal angels, angels assigned to you personally. I think I made it clear today. This is my Bible. These are my notes. This is my tie, my suit, my shoes, whatever I got. My watch. All those things belong to me. Well, I got angels assigned to me too, and they belong to me. But I'm the caretaker. They're not in charge of me. I'm in charge of them. Yes. That's right. That's right. Not to make me sound arrogant, but to make me sound genuine. Yeah. You know, if you just knew what I was saying, I'd get a better amen at that point. You can try it again. Amen right here. Amen. amen. There we go. Now catch it up. <laughs> the angels are to serve me. I'm not serving them. I appreciate their protection. I appreciate them helping me. I really do. And I think, but, it's, but, you know, I'm aware of them. But they're sent to help me in the earth, so I put them to work. All right. Verse 10, though, Jesus speaking, Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. Talking about children, and I looked that up and studied it. It was a pretty young child. Could have been maybe a year or two old even, or really young. For I say unto you that in heaven, now I'm going to come back to that, in their angels, T-H-E-I-R, their angels, just like this is my Bible, my watch, etc. Their angels do always bold the face of my Father, which is in heaven. Yeah. I want you to look at that a minute with me. And besides that, he didn't even designate that they had to be saved people. Yeah. I just thought I'd bring that out to you. Mm -hmm. So I know there's at least 8 billion angels or much more signed to human beings in the planet because there's 8 there's about 8 million, 8 million people. Is that right? 8 million, yeah. Did I say that right? 8 what? Billion, thank you. I knew I didn't say something right. 8 billion. That's a lot of people and a lot of angels. But you know, sometimes, here's another thing I'll say to you, because I know you got questions probably, and I'm not opening it up for hands to be raised and ask me. But a lot of times people say, well, I know this couple, they love God, but they had to bury their children. What happened? Well, I don't know. I wasn't there. I wasn't, that, I wasn't the father of those kids. I just know this. Most people don't know anything about it enough to do anything about it, period. If they've ever talked to an angel. And here's another one that gets them. Well, I can't see anything. What's that have to do with talking right? <laughs> Does everything got to be right for you to talk right or what? Come on now, think with me. God's telling you, you have these beings that are assigned to you. He said here, even as little children, that in heaven, and I like to say the realm of the spirit, and I'll explain that in just a minute further, their angels do always behold the face of my Father, which is in heaven. So, you know, Paul would later say, I was caught up to the third heaven. So when I found that out, I went back to this verse, and I said, I'm listening to what you're saying, Jesus, but I don't understand what you meant when you said that in heaven their angels... Are you saying their angels were in heaven, the planet? He said, no, I didn't say that. I said, in heaven. He, and so I said to him, well, why don't you explain to me then? I said, this is Jesus. Why don't you explain to me what Paul meant, the third heaven? I think I know, but I want you to tell me. You do know, right? Of course I know. I said, well, then talk to me about it. He said, gladly. First of all, the first realm of the spirit is a heavenly realm because it's not an earthly realm. 
but it's in the earth, but it's in that unseen realm that I talked to you about this morning, morning Colossians 1.16. I don't see any angels here, but I know my angels are with me and I know your angels are with you. Yes. Because they go to church and they are assigned to you. They're not assigned to me. The ones that work with me are assigned to me. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. And, but you have angels too assigned to you. I don't know how much you know about it. You may have more availability to them to help you in some other area too. I don't know. I've been praying about this and working with this since 1980. That's a long way back, 43 years ago. And I learned bit by bit by bit, by, especially by asking questions. So I said to the Lord, I'd like you to explain this to me. You're not telling me, Lord, are you? Because I don't think you're telling me this. It's what I said to Jesus. I'm going to tell you what he told me. You're not telling me that the angels that watch over my children are in heaven, are you? No, I'm not. I said, well, good. Then explain it to me. Okay. He said, this heaven is the spiritual realm right around the natural realm. You know, if God would choose to do it, I don't think he's going to do that for us. But he can say, okay, all the angels appear to everybody in the sanctuary. They just step out of that unseen realm. Yeah. They're right here with me. They just step over in the seen realm and you'd see them. Yeah. Just like you see me. Yeah. But I'm in, a, I'm in a physical body. They're in a spiritual body. So you can't see them unless you have dreams, visions, or discerning of spirits. That's the only three ways you can see into the other realm. Like I told my granddaughter, you don't have to see anything, honey to believe in the angels that God has for you and your friends at church. You can still pray over and believe for God to protect them through the angels assigned to them. That's pretty good advice for a grandpa to tell his granddaughter. And she didn't bug me about it. She was better than most adults because they want to argue with me about it. She just took what I said at face value. I said, what? She said, Mommy said you wrote a book. I said, I did. She said, well, how come I don't have one? I said, I don't know. How come? Do you want one? She said, I sure do. I said, can you read? She said, no, but mommy said she'd read it too. <laughs> I said, fair enough. Next time I saw her, where's my book? Okay, get in the truck. I'm going to take you to get one. Get one. <laughs> it was funny. I thought it was funny. All right, so I said to the Lord, tell me about Paul now. 2 Corinthians 12, he says he was caught up to the third heaven. What did you mean by that? He said, well, the first heaven is this unseen realm that exists right along the seen realm. You know, I remember I prayed for a lady one time in my church. I think it was 95, 96, 97, 90. I don't remember the exact year. Every Wednesday night I talked on angels for, was it 18 weeks, Pastor? 15 weeks or 18? Do you remember? You don't remember. All right. You were there though, right? Back in 95 at my church. Stink with me here, Pastor. Help me. Okay. <laughs> Teasing me. And I would teach on angels every Wednesday night. And then I'd say, if you're sick, get up here. God's going to minister to you. I'm going to minister to you. And the angels that work with me are going to minister to you. Well, <clears throat> there one night, and I, and I didn't ask everybody what they need. I asked this one lady, one out of I have 50 people at the front. I said, what do you need? She said, I need a new heart. And I just tapped her on the forehead and said, let it be so, Father, and I walked on. And she fell out and fell on the floor. I didn't think any more about it for two weeks. Then she came and talked to me. She said, uh, can I talk to you a minute after service? I said, sure. She said, you knew touch me. Remember touching me? I said, I need a new heart. I said, yeah, I remember that. Joyce, her name was Joyce Stettenbentz. I said, what happened to you? She said, well, when you touched me, energy invaded my chest. And I know you didn't know this about me. I was new to you, me and my husband and two kids. You didn't know anything about me. I was having heart failure and I'm only 33 years old. I would go out and get the mail at the, garage, at the end of the driveway, say like to that pillar right there or that door. And I couldn't even make it back to the house. I'd pass out in the yard. And I said, well, what would you do? I'd have to wait for my kids or a neighbor or somebody driving by to stop and help me or my husband come home from work or my kids come home from school. And sometimes I would crawl in the door. I'd just get it open enough and be able to crawl in and roll on the carpet and just lay on the living room floor until somebody appeared or came to me. She said, but I went back to at this, this energy, she said, invaded my chest. That's why she put it. And she said, I knew it was that anointing. I went back and sat by my husband. He said, what is that power coming out of you? She said, I, I think it's the anointing. Dr. Jacobs laid hands on me. He said, huh. And so she just stayed on her for two weeks. She went back to her regular doctor. He checked her. She, he said, Joyce, I think you need to go see the heart doctor, the cardiac, cardi cardi cardiac people. She went back and saw her heart doctor. He got her in a room. He did extra MRI or whatever they do on the heart, echocardiogram, I don't know. He got her in a room where they put those slides up in lights, said this, 
Joyce, this is your heart a month ago. Click, this is your heart today. This is not the same heart. You can look at it and tell you the different. What happened to you? Well, I think she told him. I don't know what he thought about it. Probably nothing. But anyway, I mean, some doctors are pretty good doctors, even if they don't know God, you know. They're better if they know God, but anyway. So anyway, what I was saying was the angel put a heart in her when she came forward that night. I didn't put it in there. He did. Because I prayed for her and he assisted me and gave her a new heart. I had another lady out in California, actually Johnny and Debbie Simon's church in Merced, California. I, uh, had, I had this word about lungs. And remember that I told you about the one that shows up for lungs? And a bunch of people came for breathing problems. I prayed for them. This one lady, when I touched her, she went out. I didn't know her. I didn't know anything about her. They told me later, that lady in the prayer line, you t kicked her foot, you know, when she's laying down. So I said, this is for this lady. Somebody that's a friend to her, write this down. God's given her a new lung. Then I just went on. Then thinking more about three months later, doctor, I mean, Pastor Johnny Simons called me, said, that lady in the prayer line. What lady in the prayer line? Three months ago, you were at my, okay. You kicked her on the foot, said God's given her a new lung. She just got out of the surgery for having cancer on one lung. They took two thirds of it out. She went and she wanted to come see you, so she got out of the hospital and came to the meeting. We thought she was premature to do that, but she had to go back and see the surgeon in like three more weeks, and he examined her. He said, That's impossible. How do you have a new lung in your body? I cut out three thirds of the old one because you had cancer. Now you got a brand new lung. How'd you do that? I think she told him I prayed for her, but that didn't mean nothing to him. He's just doing what the doctors do. So, what I'm saying is there's angels that work with us in this and they bring parts. Yes. This one lady, she came in the prayer line. I didn't know what I prayed for about it. Just touched people, laid hands on them. She laid flat and I was up on the platform in those days had the podium up there. I like it down here better now. But anyway, and I looked back and she had a, what do you call those modesty cloths they put over people when they fall out? The cloth lady, I call them. And <laughs> you know, they a cloth. That's appropriate, but I'm just making fun for fun. Come on. Don't, don't be so rigid with me. Oh, my gosh. And I could see her hands out here, but all of a sudden I saw all this movement down in her lower abdomen. I could see it clearly. Now, I think I saw it because I'm a prophet probably. I don't know. I, nobody else said anything to her. And so I didn't run up to her. I'm not a nut after she gets up and say, hey, did you know what happened? I just waited a couple of weeks, fall, saw, fall, saw her in the foyer, and I said, hey, Kim, Come here a minute. You don't have to talk to me if it's too personal. I saw all this movement in your lower abdomen when you were laying on the floor two weeks ago on a Wednesday night. What happened? Well, when you touched me, I fell out, but two angels flew in. This was her comment. One leached into me and got the bad part. The angel on the other side had a replacement part and stuck it in me, and I've never had a problem. And this has been many years now. I just talked to her recently. She's never had a problem since 1995, that female problem she had. And when she said I had a female problem, I said, you don't need to give me more than that. I just wondered what, if you knew what happened. Said, yeah, I had a female issue. But whatever he took out, he took out that bad part and put a new part in me. And she had no stitches, no downtime, except while she laid there. <laughs> Got up, it's done, you know. That's pretty good. <laughs> Hallelujah. See, you didn't know angels could do that, did you? I was at a meeting in Chesapeake, Virginia. I don't know how many years ago that's been now, maybe 15. And one of the other speakers was on the platform preaching. I came for, I got there, my wife and I, the second day of the meeting. We couldn't make it for the first. And we were sitting at a table. They had a table set up for lunch, and he spoke, and then we went to the table where they set us. And he came off the platform. I didn't know him. He said, my name's so-and-so. And I said, yeah, I'm Dr. Jacobs. Nice to meet you. And he said, you know, I have problems with my spine, Dr. Jacobs. I don't know if somebody told him I could minister to him. I said, well, i gifted in that area. I have a lot of people who heal of scoliosis, uh, vertebrae problems, different things in people's necks, their hips. Sometimes they grow out legs as much as two inches one time. But, you know, I, how about I pray for you tonight? And I said, I'm not going to pretend it's something that God gave me because you just told me. But I will say, okay, uh, what was his name? Let me think here. I can't remember his name. Jerry McGee. I said, when I get ready to minister to people, I'll zip my Bible and I'll step aside and I'll call you out. And he was sitting back in the, to the side. He had his Bible, but he didn't look like he was looking at it. He looked pretty grumpy at me, really, the whole time I preached. 
And I thought, maybe I'm, I'm plowing his field sideways. You know what that means? That means I'm saying stuff he don't like or agree with. I don't know. I mean, that's the perception I have. But you could be misread. A lot of people look grumpy. They're not grumpy at all. I don't know if you realize that. I sure do. I've been up here too long, you know? <laughs> not everybody's sweet and smiley. What did he say? What did he say, Ethel? I don't know why I agree with that. But. Oh, brother. So anyway, I was teaching on angels. I said, uh, Jerry, step out here in the middle. And I went back to him about 12, 15 feet, and I laid hands on his head. For his, I said, that's for your spine. I stepped back like that. An angel came right up around this hip, stuck his finger down here, and he started moving something. I said, Jerry, that angel's moving something down there in your body. And he turned around and ran out of the meeting. I was at a Marriott Hotel. I thought, well, I have really ticked this guy off. He's done with me. He ran out of the meeting. But right outside the back doors to the left was the men's room. I didn't know where he went. I thought maybe he went upstairs to go to bed. I don't know. Because he didn't act like he's interested in what I was saying. But that's where you get mis misunderstood. So I just, I don't let people bug me. You know what I mean? I love you and I'll help you if I can, but I'm not going to take you home and worry about it. I'm either going to pray for you in faith or just forget it, whatever. I'm, but I'm not going to play with it. And I'm not going to certainly go home and wake, stay awake all night. Anyway, so I just went on ministering to people, and he came back in about five minutes. He's standing in the back. He's smiling. Jerry, what happened to you? Because he acts like he's all better. What happened? He said, well, you didn't know this, Dr. Jacobs. I didn't know what? You didn't know I had a kidney stone. I haven't been to the restroom in three days, and it was, it was so painful. He said, when you said that angel's moving something, I felt something moving down here. I went back, went into the men's room, and passed that stone out. I'm pain-free. Boy, then the meeting was on. Come on now. You didn't know angels could move kidney stones, did you? There's a lot you don't know. A lot I don't know. I've just seen a lot of things in my life. And a lot of times when I pray for people, and if they go back like flat and they're laying flat back, you know, I remember this one lady particularly, and I walked away from her because I'd done what I was supposed to do and went on and called for some other things. So I'm over here now. The Lord said, turn around and look at that lady about the spine. I did, and she's all sprawled out, sprawled out on her back. And this angel stood over her like this, and he reached right through her midsection into her tailbone area, and he went like this, jerked it one time. And I saw it, that whole spine just straightened right up. Went, it didn't make that sound, but that's what it looked like if there was a sound with it. She came back the next night. She was married. said, my husband checked me when I was home. He said, my spine's straighter than his. Now, I don't doubt it. Yeah. We're talking about personal angels. I got to get back on heaven in a minute. I don't know. I'm trying to get more in you than I think I can, but you act so nice to me tonight. I think I'm going <laughs> to take advantage of that niceness for just a minute or two. You know, I'm just right here and I got all this back here. Oh my goodness. You're going to have to bring breakfast to us. <laughs> Hang on a minute. So I asked the Lord back to my thought here about asking the Lord, what did Paul mean when he said he was caught up to the third heaven? So he said to me, the first heaven is the realm of the spirit. It's just called heaven because it's not earthly. It's an unseen realm. And it exists right along the natural. And the angels can periodically transform themselves into the natural and you can see them. Like the one I saw in the driveway. Or the one I saw in the vision I had when, in 1999. Or the one I saw the eight angels that came in 2008. Or other angels I've seen. I'm not talking about the, the, uh, the visions right now. but So I said, okay, what about the second heaven? And I just bought a book in a, in a like, a, I was in an airport. And you know how they have a magazine rack? They had something about NASA sent up a Hubble telescope in a satellite and sent it out into space. Not just out of our, but out of our atmosphere into another galaxy. And it's been out there now about 25 years, I think. But it said it was shooting back pictures of other planets that looked like Earth. Had water on it and all kinds of stuff. You know, what's out there? I don't know that something's out there, though, and I know that. Yeah. And the Lord said to me, the second heaven is the stellar heavens. The planets, the moons, other things. And we're just in one little galaxy that's got, I think, nine planets, unless they rejected part of those by now. Yeah. You know, people just change things so much. Pluto really isn't Pluto. Well, who is Pluto then? Is he with Disney or what? <laughs> oh my gosh. 
and I read their thing and the Lord said, yeah, that, that stellar heavens is all the planets and other bodies that are out there that I put out in outer, what you call outer space. Then he said, there is a planet in the north of the universe called heaven that is just like earth before earth fell. So I said, praise God. And that's where my wife's at and all your relatives that you love, they're out there somewhere in heaven with Jesus and all the other saints that love God live there. So that made up the third heaven. How many listen to me? So, you know, I mean, here's a little thing to tell you that I think illustrates. Isaiah 6, if you remember that passage, Isaiah 6, 1 through 8, Isaiah said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Now, who's talking? Isaiah is talking, and his feet are on the planet Earth like I am right now and yours too. He said, but I saw into heaven, and I saw the seraphim flying, <laughs> around the throne of God. And they were calling out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And the doorpost at the temple in heaven riveted at their voice. They were so powerful beings. Yeah, and Isaiah was in the planet, but he saw into heaven. So by virtue of that, I could say this with good, good confidence if you're listening to me. When you're in the spirit, time and distance plays no part in that. You see all kinds of stuff in the spirit. If you're in the spirit, that's why it says the angels that the children have can see into heaven and know God's will for certain things. And your words help license them to do that. How many are listening? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we're seeing that Jesus mentions this here. And so we're just really, I'm excited about it too. Let's go to Revelation chapter one here. I think I mentioned this a minute ago, but I want to go back and you're going to give me another few minutes. I know, and I'm not trying to keep you unduly. You're not going to hear this on Fox news tonight. Come on folks. I would be shocked if you see a Christian program talking like I'm talking tonight. I mean, there could be, I don't know, but I doubt it. And sometimes I watch things on TV about stuff, and when they're done, I say, what's wrong with those people? They don't know anything. Yeah. What did they think they were telling us? Yeah. Amen. I saw a nationally broadcasted, I'm not going to mention the man's name, I'm not slander, per, I don't slander people. But he's had a, a ministry that covers the whole United States on TV, and I sat down to watch him one Sunday, Unfortunately, my wife said to me, and she was right, don't watch it, honey, you'll be mad. He said, I'm going to talk about angels today. I said, okay, I'm going to see what this guy knows. And he didn't know much. It was, bad. It was sad. It's pathetic. He made a couple of generic statements that were accurate, but he never told you any parts you play in is all up to God. And he said, go home, play with your kids, kiss your wife. God bless you. See you next Sunday. Well, you didn't help me, brother. You should have kept your mouth shut. What would you even bring it up for? See, that's the way I'm thinking. I'm not mad at him. I'm just mad at his, the way he presented that because he didn't present it accurately like it's all up to God. Listen, it's never all up to God. Just so you know what I'm saying. You have more to play with your own life than you ever dreamed of. If you just took the responsibility for it, you could see it. My steps are ordered by the Lord. That is if I obey him. If he says go that way and I decide to go here, I can do that. But then I'm in trouble over here. I become a target for the devil. All right, just talking about some things here with you. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1 says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, gave to Jesus, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Notice his angel. So Jesus has his angel because he was birthed here just like all the rest of us through the womb of a woman. Now his father wasn't Joseph. His father was the Holy Ghost and the seed that was in her which the Greek calls sperm came from the Holy Ghost. But he was still a man. He wasn't some other kind of person. He was a man. And Hebrews, not Hebrews, Philippians 2 says he emptied himself of his divine privileges and became a man. I'm going to let him be a man and follow his leading as a man too. Because he never sinned. All right. So we're seeing some things. Are you seeing some things with me? All right. So let's go to uh, Psalm 34. I asked the Lord one time, a while back, several years ago, Psalm 34, verse 7. I said, do you have one verse in particular that would help me with beginning to show people what kind of conditions they need to meet 
so that their angels are free to operate and work? He said, yeah, I do. Psalm 30, 34, 7. So I knew that scripture and I turned over there and I'm going to read it to you here. Psalm 34, 7. Now I'm trying to show you this is what God expects of us who follow God, especially with the angels. The angel of the Lord, that's a particular angel, but I don't believe that's the, the angel of the Lord in this passage because I'll show you why. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them. This angel, any angel, can only be one place at one time. I've never seen it fail in the Bible. Amen. However many angels there are, they're innumerable, so that's a bunch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Somebody said to me, you think he's going to run out? I said, no, he's a creator. You do know that, right? <laughs> so if he gets low down at the stockpile, he'll just create some more. Yeah. <laughs> the angel of the Lord, there is an angel called the angel of the Lord, but he can still only be one place at one time. He's not God. The Holy Ghost is omniscient. He can be anywhere in the, in the universe at the same time. The Holy Ghost, he's God. But an angel can only be one physical place at a time. I just learned that. I just learned it recently. I learned it a long time ago. I'm talking to you about it. But the reason I know this wasn't one single angel, it was the angel of the Lord in the fact that God created this angel who is going to encamp around about the person that fears God. I have an angel that's been given to me and he's watching me to see if I've reverenced God in my life. Amen. He's watching you to see if you've reverenced God in your life. Yeah. And unfortunately, you can't wake up one day after I'm gone for four days, you start saying things and the fifth, sixth, seventh and the hundredth day, you don't bring it up and expect it to work right. Yeah. Yeah. Your marriage would be shot if you did that with your wife. Right. Yeah. You told her you loved her four days in a row and then didn't repeat it for four or five months. That wouldn't work. I don't blame her. Yeah. I'm not getting in your business. I'm just talking. Yeah. You've got to stay with things. Yes. The more you stay with it, the easier it'll be. Yes. I think I've been saying I, I'm delivered from all injury, harm, and destruction because my angels have charge over me. I've been saying that about 25 to 30 years now. Yes. And the angels that belong to my children because they got big enough to have driver's license and I wouldn't have put a tail on them. You know, like a secret detective to figure out where they went. Right. Just wanted you to know. Yeah. And I believe God to show me things that I need to tell them about their life. And I brought my kids both one time in their life, I cast the devil out of them at home on the couch. <laughs> sure did. Sure did. This is real as anything to me. And they weren't bad kids. That something was influencing them. I just grabbed my son. I said, come here a minute. I grabbed him and prayed for him. But my daughter was on the couch laying down. I said, I'm going to pray for you. Be quiet and listen. In Jesus' name, come out. I rebuked that thing off her. Same for my son. So the angel of the Lord, let me, I'm getting into this with you here. He comes to encamp. The Hebrew word is to abide or to settle. And the Webster's Dictionary, to encircle or surround. So the angel assigned to you will encircle and surround you if you'll do the rest of this verse. Them that fear him, that fear the Lord. This word fear in the Hebrew means to worship, respect, and devotion. It means to revere God, to adore or respect God in word and action. So that doesn't mean that I'm, when it says fear there, that I'm just lifting my hands. Uh, when Kendall says, lift your hands. I mean, she's ever ever right to say that. She's a praise and worship leader. But if that's the only time I ever lift my hands when she tells me to, I'm a phony. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know, I lift my hands in my hotel room. Yeah. Yeah. I commend the peace of God to come into the hotel room. Right. I think you asked me, Pastor, Pastor, uh, Pastor Dave asked me about William Branham. He lived and died right close to where I live, about 10 miles from me, maybe not even that much. I went over to his grave a few times. You can feel the anointing when you get out of your car. He's been gone since 64, 62. He was an anointed man of God. Well, he wasn't anointed in everything or he wouldn't die young, but he was anointed. But he began to be popular because of the anointing on him. And so, you know, you have to, you can't be a person that's publicating a lot of books if you don't rightly divide the word. God will not allow that indefinitely. God didn't do anything to him. But because you disobey things and you think you get to a place where you can do anything you want, you're in big trouble. And you're going to get judged for that if you're not careful. I know I'm not talking like Mr. Friendly right now, but I'm just talking to you. Take it or leave it. Do what you want with it. 
Uh, but anyway, I'm just thinking about that. And he had a lot of angelic visitations. But then in his mind, he just didn't have an education where he could write good, where you could understand it easily, and he got all confused about it. Hey, I'm not downgrading the guy. Listen, I write books too. Just talking to you a minute. The angel of the Lord encamps round about them that fear him. So remember I said, if the only time you ever raise your hand is when Kendall says, let's lift our hands. Mm, beep, I don't think that's good. I don't think that's good. You need to be lifting your hands at home. I was going to tell about William Branham. I haven't done his deal yet. He went to a hotel one time and they, he made them change his room 11 times to get a room that weird stuff hadn't been done in. That's how sensitive he was. And I'm not even going to tell you what he, what he said was done there. You couldn't handle it. Yeah. Hey, there's a little something, a spider. <laughs> you don't want to land on my pages. I'm going to zip you up in a minute. That's okay. Hey, you got it. See, I'm talking to you about some things here. It says that when they, we fear God, so there's a worship and a respect. Let me say the way I look at it. There's worship and respect for all of you if this is your church, for your pastors, Pastor Dave and Kendall. Yes. There's worship and respect for your fellow brothers and sisters. Whether they're male or female has nothing to do with it, but you should show respect and honor for all of your brothers and sisters and not trying to search out all their weaknesses. Because yes. I can tell you if you try to look too hard, you're going to find plenty. You know, I'm just a man. Dr. Summerall said that all great men of God, I'm not calling myself great, but all great men of God have feet of clay. That means that we're not perfect yet. I'm working on that to get more perfect. You know what I mean? And restrict myself of what I allow myself to look at or see or say. A lot of things goes into that comment. Just talking to you here. You want to be used to God, you've got to be dedicated. And that would probably mean being beyond where you're at. You might be dedicated to where you're at right now at this level, but if God says, I want you up here, then you'll have to come up a couple levels and it may require some other flesh-killing things yes. that you have to take yourself through. That's yeah. all I'm saying. I'm not yeah. belittling anybody. We're all people. Yeah. Jesus' blood cleanses me and you. All right. Anyway, yeah, it's pretty good. I think so. Let me, let me say something to you here real quick here. So with this is, I'm giving you those words and it says, and delivereth them. That word deliver in the Hebrew means to escape wholly, to deliver fully, and to liberate people. See, when you want to be delivered and delivered from everything that would hold you back, then you have to do this verse. You begin to show reverence towards God and the things of God. I say your pastors are number one, your Bible, if you're married, your mate, and, and your children raising your kids right and all that goes with that. And you know, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. But I'm just talking to you here a minute. Now, I want to talk to you just for a second. Let's go to Psalm 91. And I'm just about ready to close. I really am. And it's almost 9 o'clock. Psalm 91 here. Uh, and I, I made this comment in one of my meetings about two or three months ago. I said, I think that even though I'm a Hebrews 8, 6 guy, in the better covenant with better promises, better blood, that's the new covenant, I don't know of any covenant that's coming beyond that, to tell you the truth. Maybe you do. If you find one, you can let me know. I don't know of any. It's the best covenant we've had with God for all eternity, this new covenant. But I said, I think Psalm 91 would be the place I would go to learn about releasing angelic beings. And I said that out of my spirit. Didn't know anybody else had said it. And I got reading Brother Hagin's book on faith food. You know, the devotionals, he has faith food and health food. And I just it was a couple of days away from that whenever... And I read it. He said he believes Psalm 91 is the best chapter in the Bible on, uh, on praying for your angels and stuff. I said, well, hey, I said something a real great man said. I, I feel good about that. Yeah. Would you feel good if Brother Hagin said what you said? Yes. You should be. Yeah. Or Dr. Dufresne or whoever, yeah. you know, or Pastor Nancy, whoever your champion is. Yeah. I'm just saying. So we'll go over here just a minute. I wanted to make mention of something here. Uh, and show you where I got this comment. First of all, Psalm 91, let me read a few verses. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So I say this is not just church attendance. 
Doesn't say anything about church. Of course, if you do dwell in the secret place or that holy place with him and tightness, he's going to tell you to find a good New Testament church and be involved there. Give your money there. Be involved there. Get, volunteer to do something. Run a sweeper. Change a diaper. Uh, work in the parking lot. Watch the kids. Fix dinner for somebody. I don't know. There's all kinds of stuff you could do. And then he said, I will say of the Lord, he's my refuge and my fortress. You're my God and, and you will I trust. I like to say that every day. And I say, Father, I'm dwelling in the secret place. I, this is the way I deserve it. I'm in tight with Jesus today. That's the way I'm saying it. I'm, I'm staying tight with him. Not doing things I shouldn't do. Not seeing things I shouldn't see. Not saying things I shouldn't say. Amen. So that's a lot more than just churchy people. I mean, but churchy people can qualify. Right. I'm a church person. I love the church. That's why I'm doing what I do. Why would I be doing this all my life, going from church to church to church? Now, that's all I do. And I, I'm glad that I do it. I'm trying to help the body of Christ. I don't know everything, but I know some things. And then he goes on saying different things. Then we get to verse 10. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. So when I say that, I say there's no evil shall befall me when my home or my body. My body's my dwelling too. I live inside this physical body. So I say no, no, no devil's going to get in there and no, no evil's going to invade me. How many listening? And then I went down here. Let me find this verse here. I think it's verse maybe... 11, for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, that word keep thee, in all thy ways. Of course, if you're doing what we do in the first part of this, you're staying tight with God. And he gives his angels charge over us to keep us in all of our ways. And uh, the word keep there in the Hebrew meant to watch, to keep safe, to protect, or to preserve. God's going to preserve us if we walk with him and stay close to him. That's what I'm trying to say to you. And then I took the, a, a little liberty here. Uh, one of my spiritual sons bought me Webster's original dictionary. It's about that thick. It's almost this big of this, this top of this thing. It's about that high. It, take, it takes two men to lift it almost. Not really, but it's 40, probably 25, 25 pounds. And I looked up the word preserve, and this is what it says in Webster's. To keep safe from injury, harm, or destruction. See, I say the angels keep, keep care of me and keep me safe from all injury, harm, or destruction. Hallelujah. That would mean anybody with a gun that wants to gun down people at McDonald's yeah, right. to a drunk or a drug addict on the road going 100 miles an hour yeah. that's going to run into my car if I don't believe for something beyond that. Yeah. To fly in an airplane, to drive my vehicle, yeah. Yeah. to go wherever I need to go without any apprehension. So I wanted to read something real special to you if you'd allow me to take another few minutes. And a friend of mine, I've known this gentleman for about 40 years. He's kind of a normal human being, but he's kind of a scientist guy. His name is Paul Jansen. He's in my church. Um, and uh, I love him dearly. And he was telling me a story about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That's when they dropped the atomic bomb on those two, bomb on those two cities. And he told me about these Jesuit priests that were there when the bomb fell. First one's about the one in Hiroshima, the Hiroshima 8, they called them. These were Jesuit priests working with the Catholic Church and saying the rosary every day and things like that. Now, you don't make fun of people. I'm going to tell you something here. Uh, this is what it says. On early in, You mind me reading this to you? I think it, uh, let, me, let me read this other verse for you first. Uh, verse 7 in Psalm 91, a thousand shall fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near thee. I think with these two cities alone, they killed 100,000 people with the atomic bombs. And it wasn't just where the bomb fell. It spread out for 10 miles in every direction. It flattened the cities, except for this church where these Jesuit priests lived. <laughs> <laughs> and one of them was eating breakfast when it went off. He thought there was an explosion of a tanker because they have a port there where they fill their submarines with oil and ships. But it wasn't that. It was the bomb going off. And he didn't realize it. He's sitting there trying to eat his breakfast. All of a sudden, this wind comes into his house and tosses him around and right out through a plate grass window into the yard. All he had was some cuts on his neck. He was spared. No radiation. The other, it was called the Hiroshima 8 in the, that one. And he was just one of those guys. His name was Friar Schniffner, a Jesuit missionary assisting the many Catholics of that city. 
And on August the 6th, 1945, he just finished mass and sat down at his breakfast table. As he plunged his spoon into his freshly sliced grapefruit, there was a bright flash of light. He thought it was a fuel tanker that exploded in the harbor, as Hiroshima was a major port. I just said that. But suddenly a terrible explosion filled the air uh, with one bursting thunderstroke, an invisible force lifted me up out of the chair, hurled me through the air, shook me, battered me, whipped me around like a leaf in a gust of autumn wind. Next thing you remember, he opened his eye and found himself on the ground outside this church. Of course, the church was still standing. It's got a picture back here of everything else. There's nothing but that church. For miles and miles, it just flattened everything. I'm going to read it to you. It's just really interesting. Suddenly, a terrible explosion filled the air. And I said that. Let me see. So had a few cuts on his neck of his neck. And as far as he could tell, nothing physically was wrong with him. The small community of Jesuits to which uh, Friar uh, Schniffner belonged was a house near the parish church, only eight blocks from the center of the blast. And when Hiroshima was destroyed by the atomic bomb, bomb, all eight members of the small Jesuit community escaped unscathed, while every other person within a radius of one and a half kilometers from ground zero died immediately. The house where they lived was still standing. There's a picture of it right here. And everything else flattened. I'm just showing you, this was 1945, and I think they told them to hush it hush, you know, like they do something about other things in our news that we don't hear about until it's way too late. Anyway, uh, let me find this. Uh, they escaped unscathed with every other person within a radius of one and one half kilometers from Grand Zero, died immediately. The house where the Jesuits lived was still standing while buildings in every direction from it were leveled. Father Hubert Schnifter was 30 years old when the atomic bomb exploded right over his head in Hiroshima. He not only survived, but he lived a healthy life for another 33 years. So he was 63 when he went on. That's way too early, but that's all he knew probably back then. You know, like some of us, we didn't know we could live to be 120. When I got 60 and finally figured that out, I thought, well, I'm only halfway home. I mean, if I want to stay here that long, we'll see. How did these men... A group of men survive a nuclear blast that killed everyone else, even people over 10 times further away from the blast. It's absolutely unexplainable by scientific means. Even more astonishing is the story that was repeated a few days later in Nagasaki, the second Japanese city to be hit by an atomic bomb. In both Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the survivors were Catholic and religious. Most other buildings were leveled to the ground, even at three times the distance. But in both cases, their houses stood, even while some windows were intact. All other people, bar a handful of scattered, mutilated survivors, even at three times the distance from the explosion died instantly. They just melted. It says it was 25,000 or 35,000 degrees, that blast. Wow. With those within a radius of 10 times the distance of the Jesuits were exposed to fierce radiation and died within days. After the Americans conquered Japan, U.S. Army doctors explained to Friar Schniffner, that was the first guy we talked about in uh, well, Hiroshima, that his body would soon begin to deteriorate because of the radiation. To the doctor's amazement, Friar Schiffner's body showed no radiation or ill effects from the bomb. All who were in this range from the epicenter should have received enough radiation to be dead within a matter of minutes. And scientists examined the group of Hiroshima Jesuits over 200 times during the next 30 years and no ill effects were ever found. That just makes you wonder. You know, science knows something, but they don't know stuff like this. <laughs> I just thought that was a great story. Back to this, it says, you know, a thousand will fall at one side, 10,000 not come near you. It was over 100,000 people died in those two cities within minutes. It said the people's bodies just evaporated. It was so intense. So I just thought I'd share that with you. There are things that like that happen even in our society. Well, in 1945, but it says in here, they probably warned them not to talk about it, you know, because it was such an act of God. How do you withstand an atomic blast? And you're only like not too far away from the epicenter where it hit. It just go by you and you just disappear because you're evaporated with that heat. But see, God protects us. That's what I'm saying. 
Hallelujah. Well, stand up with me for a minute. Praise God. <laughs> Hope we did okay. It's 9.08. Hallelujah. I still got something I need to say to you. I mean, by way of ministry time. We have an anointing for teeth and uh, gum problems and things like that. So if you have any problem like that with your teeth, your gums, or you do that, what's that called, that TMJ? We get people healed of that too. I have a little young lady, what well, she's 25 or 30 now in my church. She's been with me a long time. The church where my son pastors, my wife and I started it 38 years ago, so we've been there a long time. But she was young and she was a, a young adult and he had all kinds of stuff in her mouth for her to sleep at night because she had such bad TMJ. I prayed for her one time. He, she went back to the orthodontist or whatever he's called and said, you can get rid of that, you're good. So, and then we've had teeth grow out. We've had all kinds of stuff happen, people's gums. and So if you have any problem with your teeth, I'd like you to come up here a minute. Let me pray for you. If you have any kind of teeth issues, and we'll just believe with you. Praise the Lord. And no, I'm not a registered dentist. I just know what God will do for you if you, ha if you have need of that. Is that all right? I'm going to start down here tonight on to my left. Okay, Father, let, everybody lift your hands that's in this line. Father, we just thank you for the anointing that destroys the yoke. I pray for their mouth, their teeth, their jaw, their gums to all be healed. Whatever they might need along that line, Father, I believe for you to move on them and cause healing to flow in the name of Jesus. Receive your healing in the name of Jesus. That's it right there. Watch her. Receive your healing, sir, in the name of Jesus. That's it right there. It's went into you. Receive your healing in your mouth, your teeth, your gums. Receive your healing in the name of Jesus. That's it right there. Receive your healing in the name of Jesus. Jesus makes you whole tonight. Hallelujah. Receive your healing in the name of Jesus. Jesus makes you whole tonight. Receive your healing in the name of Jesus. Oh, there it is right there. That anointing went on you. In Jesus' name, receive your healing in your teeth, your jaw. In Jesus' name, in your gums, in the name of Jesus. Receive your healing in the name of Jesus right now by the power of the living God going into your mouth and making things normal. In Jesus' name, praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Who is it here that you have a little bit of a heart problem? I don't know exactly what it is, but I see something about your heart. I don't know if it's out of rhythm or there's a, a valve that doesn't work completely right or something to do with your heart. Who would that be? I'd like you to come up here and let me minister to you if that's you. Hallelujah. Something about your heart. Some kind of malfunction or something. I'm not sure what it is. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah, okay, come on up here and tell me a little bit. Father, we thank you for the power of God right now on this lady. We pray that power goes into that heart and makes her whole, fixes that, makes it normal in the name of Jesus. There it is right there. You too? Father, we thank you for fixing this heart, making it function correctly. No problems in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Were you going to say something to me? Well, I was just, like, they checked it out. It discomforts you. Yeah. It does act up on you some, we'll say, in this area. Father, we pray for this heart to be healed in the name of Jesus by the power of the living God. And there's that anointing to fix it right there, sir, coming on you. I know you can feel that warmth moving on you. Yeah, can't you? Yeah, praise God. That heat went out of my hand into your chest. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. We thank you for that. Praise God. There's somebody here, I don't, I'd say that you fell something and I don't know if it's your ribs or it's your hip that's messed up. I don't know which it is, but if that's you, I'd like to pray for you real quick here before we go. Something about either your ribs or your, or your hip. I don't know which area that was, but it seems like somebody fell. That's you? Where'd you fall at? We were playing soccer. Okay. And somebody land on, the on your ribs? And it kind of jammed. Yeah, and it's still a problem? It's just never been never been right. Father, we pray for those ribs to be right in the name of, that's the anointing right there on you. Be right in Jesus' name. 
by the power of God, we speak healing to every of these ribs to function right and be normal and not be painful or a problem in the name of Jesus. We thank you for it, Father. Amen. Praise God. You know, I gave that word one time and the pastor's wife came forward and she wasn't married to the guy that did this to her, but she said, my ex-husband beat me up, broke all my ribs. I said, he what? You don't mean the guy that's here right now, do you? You mean a different guy. I think some of the men were gonna tackle him, but she said, no, but my ex-husband beat me up real bad one time, broke my rib. Said it bothered me ever since, kind of like this gentleman said, it bothered me, he got hurt and it just continued to be a problem. I prayed for it and God healed all those ribs completely. Hallelujah. We're learning how to yield to the Holy Ghost. Learning how to yield to the Holy Ghost. All right, I'm gonna give one more word here and I'd like you to come as quickly as you can because I'm about done for tonight. I'm gonna say this very confidently, but if you feel like, listen to me carefully here, you could have a bad day, everybody has a bad day. Everybody I know has a bad day. Maybe they do good better in faith than some of us, or maybe I do better than some others, but I don't let something beat me up and stay on me. But there's something about your life that you feel like you're depressed and you can't get out of that hole. Do you know what I'm saying by that? You can't get out of that. You're just like, you're surviving, but it's like things just continue to bombard you. I'm talking to you. I'd like you to come. I'm gonna pray for you to be delivered from that. If that's you, respond and we'll minister to you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for coming. Hallelujah. Praise God. Yep, you're the one I'm looking for. <laughs> In the name of Jesus, come out of her. Loose her and let her go free. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Come on up, ma'am. Hallelujah. Father, we command that thing broken over my sister's life. Come out of her. Spirit of depression, I rebuke you. Command you to take your hands off of God's property. In Jesus' mighty name. There it went. Praise God. It left you. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, come out of her. Spirit of depression, I rebuke you. I break your power over her life and over her mind, over her emotions. In Jesus' name, loose her and let her go free now. In the name of Jesus. There's the anointing coming on you to confirm that and make that work for you right here. In the name of Jesus, come out of her. Spirit of depression, I break your power over her life right now. In the name of Jesus, command you to depart be no more involved in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's the way it's supposed to work. <laughs> all right. Praise God. Let's just all thank God for that. Father, we thank you for making the body whole, the body of Christ here whole. And we give you praise for it in the name of Jesus. Thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' mighty name. Praise God, praise God. Now, and when people get up and go back to their seats and go back to live wherever they live, they're gonna be different. And you need to say, I'm delivered if you were up here. I got delivered tonight and I'm free from that. And stand your ground. Because the devil will try to come back if you, if you let him. So you just keep resisting. No, I'm delivered. Dr. Jacob prayed for me and whatever that was left me and I got delivered. Hallelujah. You ever been delivered, Dr. Jacob? Yes, I have. At least twice in my life. At least twice in my life. You know, because I was a drug addict before I was a preacher. And one day I woke up and I was in the ministry. I don't know how many years I'd been in the ministry then, maybe four or five. And all of a sudden I had these images in my mind and they were not nice. They were nasty stuff. And I didn't even do half the things I was seeing, but I was so shocked that that took a hold of me. First thing I did, I went to my wife. I said, I don't have a girl on the side. I'm not watching porn. Are you listening to me? I'd like you to listen to me a minute because it's important what I'm telling you. It's humiliating to have to tell you that, but that's just what was going on. But like I said, he was showing me things I never even dreamed of doing. Some of it I did, but not all of it. And I felt so filthy, you can imagine. And I'm a pastor. But I went to my wife first and I said, I am not, I am not been unfaithful to you, honey. I'm not watching things I shouldn't watch. But the devil, and you know what, why, why I got attacked like? I was starting to learn about the, what I just ministered to some of you deliverance. And the devil was afraid I was gonna get a hold of it. So he attacked me. And unfortunately, I didn't know what to do. I'd only been spirit filled for three months. 
So you can understand I was immature in that realm. I tried to use the name of Jesus against him and plead the blood and everything I knew to do at my limited mentality. But I went to a meeting from a friend's church of mine that I prayed with. He was a Christian church pastor, spirit filled. We had great times together praying. He said, I'm having a guest speaker, Michael, come be, come and listen on Sunday night or whatever. So I came, I was five miles from him. And there were people in the church, probably members of my church behind me, sitting behind me, I was on the front row. And the guy that preached didn't touch me. But he said, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine, uh, George Gray. So George Gray got up as friend of the, pa the preacher that preached in the meeting. I don't know if I've confused you. He was just going to say hello to us. But when he started talking, I was standing there looking at him. I was just five or six feet away from him. The Lord said, go up and tell him what your problem is. He can help you. I said, well, he's got a mic like this. And I'm, so I went gingerly, took his hand where the mic was at and went like this. And I looked at him. I said, I'm a preacher. I used to be a drug addict. And the devil has filled my mind with filth and I don't want to live like this. I'm not encouraging it. I'm not messing around on my wife. I'm not watching pornographic material or anything else. And I want delivered. And he didn't even break rank. He just had his Bible and his mic. He laid the Bible on my head, said, wash him with the water of the word. Power of God went down my jaw, in my chest, down to my toes and out my toes. I thought I blew every toenail off. I really was looking for him where I'm standing like this. But <laughs> I, it was so powerful, it went foom, foom. It took less than five seconds, I got delivered. Hallelujah. Totally delivered. That was way, way back in Otisco. That would have been 78 to 82. But I got delivered. And it really confirmed to me there was such a thing as deliverance. Even though I just graduated from Baptist Seminary, they didn't teach that. But I knew there was something to that realm, especially after that happened to myself. And I was just starting to learn when God spoke to me, I told you about that. I want you to learn about devil and demons. But I don't want you to read other people's books. I don't want you to listen to other people's teachings. Just read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, book of Acts. Make notes of what I did in the gospels, how I ministered. Make notes of what the early church did in the book of Acts. Do that and you won't have any problems. And I did that and I just stayed true to that since 1978. Thank you so much for your enthusiasm. <laughs> If you were me and you were feeling like, you know, what in the world's happening to me? My mind is filled with stuff I don't want to think about, but I don't know how to get it out. And that man had got a lot more mature than me. He was probably 30 years my senior. I became friends with him, had him come to my church and preach several times. A great man of prayer, really a help to me in my life at that moment. But I got delivered that one moment in less than five seconds, it seemed like. And I was so thankful. So thankful. And then my mind seemed to be normal after that. Of course, I keep renewing it to the Word. You know what I'm saying. And I don't watch the living dead and weird stuff either. You know, or anything like that. I'm done, Pastor, for tonight. Thank you so much for coming back tonight. Come back tomorrow night if you can.